Bali is gaining attention as an example of sustainable agriculture. Traditional systems of rice cultivation in Bali combine cultural organizations with religious rituals to develop complex schedules for planting, irrigation, and harvesting wet rice paddies. Balancing changing water needs, fertilizer inputs, and pest control, these schedules maximize the yields on thousands of individual rice terraces. Interestingly, these ancient practices have proven superior in many cases to modern technological approaches of industrial agriculture. Lying just below the equator, next to the island of Java, Bali is blessed with fertile volcanic soil and a warm, moist climate that produces bountiful rice harvests. Numerous rivers pour down the mountain slopes of Bali, but they've cut deep valleys that provide little level land for farming. To grow their crops, Balinese farmers have created thousands of terraces that step up the hillsides or cluster together on the tops of high ridges. Some of these terraces have been cultivated for a thousand years without decreasing crop yields. Although there's generally lots of water in the valleys, getting it to the rice paddies has always been a difficult problem for the Balinese. Small dams called weirs divert water from rivers into irrigation canals that wind their way through tunnels and cross aqueducts until they reach the paddies where the water is needed. A group of paddies supplied by a single irrigation canal is called a subak. Many farmers may own land within the subak, and they work together as a cooperative to maintain the canal system and to decide democratically on planting and irrigation schedules that optimize water supplies and minimize pest outbreaks for everyone. As the canal enters the subak, it's divided again and again into smaller and smaller channels to deliver water to terraces at different levels. Eventually, higher terraces drain into lower ones. Throughout the paddies, you constantly hear the sound of running water. Religion permeates life in Bali. Every home and shop has a shrine or small temple where daily offerings are made to the gods to ask for their blessings. Religious rites also regulate farming. Every farmer has a small field shrine dedicated to the rice and water goddesses. And every subak has its own temple where farmers gather for rituals and discussion of planting and irrigation schedules. Each subak temple is a subordinate to the Maseti water temple that coordinates a group of subaks that get their water from common weir. Water temples often feature sacred springs or pools as symbols of the source of crucial water supplies. Eventually, all the water temples are subordinate to the mother temple in the crater of Lake Batur, which is considered the ultimate source of all the water on the island. In the 1950s and 60s, Indonesia suffered from a series of severe food shortages and widespread malnourishment. The country needed to import more than a million tons of rice per year. These food shortages played a role in the overthrow of the Sukarno government in 1965. The new Suharto government immediately instituted a program of agricultural development to improve food supplies. One of the first targets for farm improvements was Bali, which had long been the rice bowl for Indonesia. Just as the Indonesian government was trying to boost rice production, the International Rice Institute in the Philippines released new high-yielding hybrid rice varieties. These Green Revolution varieties were high responders. That is, given high inputs of water, fertilizer, and pesticides, they could double rice yields compared to traditional varieties. However, as this graph shows, under less than optimal conditions, traditional breeds, which often have broad tolerance levels, can actually produce higher harvests than the hybrid strains. Balinese farmers were encouraged to plant rice as quickly as possible without regard for traditional irrigation schedules. But the immediate gains in yield produced by this policy soon began to be offset by water shortages and unprecedented outbreaks of rice pests and diseases. Bureaucrats, even Balinese ones in the Department of Agriculture, seemed unaware or unconcerned with religion's role in establishing planting and irrigation schedules. According to agricultural technicians, growing rice is simply a matter of science and engineering. Traditional practices, in their view, were simply old-fashioned superstitions, where, under traditional systems, all the paddies in a subak were planted together and then had a fallow period of several months after harvest. The drive to plant as quickly as possible after harvest gradually created a chaotic pattern in which every paddy had it was in a different stage of development. After several years of disastrous harvests, many farmers revolted and went back to the traditional patterns ranged through the temples. A brilliant analysis of the role of water temples in Balinese agriculture can be found in Stephen Lansing's 1990 book, Priests and Programmers, as well as in his 2006 book on the same subject, titled Perfect Order, Recognizing Complexity in Bali. In these books, Lansing examines the social dynamics of agroecology in Bali.
It seems the temple priests don't dictate agricultural practices so much as they act as mediators to bring about a consensus among the Subak members. By working together on canal maintenance and in carrying out temple ceremonies, the Subak members create a sense of community that supports and enforces cooperative actions. One of the problems with uncoordinated planting schedules was water stress. Rice needs a flooded paddy during the growing season and then needs to dry out as the grain ripens. In Subak's design to have water flow from paddy to paddy, it's impossible to accommodate many different planting times. The volcanic soil of Bali contains relatively abundant phosphate and potassium. The traditional fallow period gives time for upstream erosion to replenish mineral supplies in the paddies. Furthermore, azala and other nitrogen-fixing plants grow during the fallow period. Before planting, this green manure is pushed down into the mud to nourish the rice seedlings. Ducks play an important role in the lash paddy ecology. They eat the spilled grains, frogs, snails, eels, and small fish that live in the paddy. Duck droppings help fertilize the rice plants, and at the end of the growing season, the ducks become food for humans. Rats are one of the main rice field pests. Paddy rats reproduce only when the rice plants are flowering. This means the baby rats are born just as the rice is ripening and food is most abundant. Baby rats mature in three weeks, and each female can produce a litter of 12 babies every three weeks after that. With only two rice crops a year, the rats have only two litters a year. But when paddies are planted throughout the year, a single female rat can have as many as 120 babies. Exponential growth can produce astronomical numbers of rats that can destroy an entire crop. Green Revolution hybrids are also highly susceptible to insect pests and diseases. One of the worst problems in the 1980s was the brown leafhopper. These insects can fly readily from paddy to paddy, and a dense infestation can destroy an entire crop. Leafhoppers like young, tender rice plants. A long fallow period can reduce insect numbers, but continuous cropping results in a population explosion. The Indonesian government provided insecticides to fight leafhoppers. Broad-spectrum pesticides killed beneficial species as well as pests. This leads to a condition known as pesticide rebound, in which it takes more and more spray to give the same level of protection, and pest populations get larger and larger after each application. Stephen Lansing and a systems ecologist named James Kramer studied one set of Subox in great detail. 172 Subox occur between the Os and Petanu rivers in Jianyar, just east of Ubud. The Subox are subdivided into 12 groups, each of which has its own water temple and major weir where the water is diverted from the river. Lansing and Kremer collected hydrologic and production statistics for each Subox. It's difficult to do controlled studies on fields on which local farmers depend for their livelihood. So Lansing and Kramer created a computer model to test various management strategies. The problem faced by the Subox is how to maximize water availability and pest control. If everyone plants at the same time, they'll also harvest at the same time, and a widespread fallow period will reduce pest populations by depriving them of food and or habitat. On the other hand, if everyone plants at the same rice variety simultaneously to coordinate their harvest and fallow periods, then the irrigation demand cannot be staggered and water stress will occur. The model tested seven planting schedules ranging from all the subucks acting as a single unit to, at the far extreme, every farmer planting whenever he or she wants to. As you can see, the highest water stress occurs when all the subucks plant in unison, and the lowest water stress is when the te water temples coordinate planting. If you add pest control to the model, then the situation becomes more complex. Pest damage is shown by the black diamonds and the right y-axis. As previously mentioned, pest outbreaks are highest when each farmer follows an individual schedule. The least damage occurs when the water temples coordinate planting schedules. Putting these two variables together, we find that the highest yield in tons per hectare occurs when the temples set cropping patterns, while the lowest yield is found when the subucks set their own cropping patterns. If Lansing's estimates are correct, the farmers in these subucks, even though they use far less chemical fertilizers and pesticides, are getting just as much rice per hectare as farmers in the U.S. Many paddies in the subuck are too small for machines, so most labor is done by hand. Volunteer rice stocks grown from spilled grain are chopped down and turned under the soil. Ripe rice is harvested by hand and threshed by beating stalks on a basket or a board.
Shaft is removed from the grain by winnowing. Full rice bags are transported to market by motorcycle. By optimizing planting and irrigation schedules, Subax minimize rice pests and diseases while producing the best possible yields for everyone. Altogether, the terraced rice paddies create a beautifully engineered landscape and an interesting example of the integration of tradition, culture, and religion in cooperative agroecology and sustainability.